Hello everyone and welcome back to the channel. I am Jelte and I'm one of the long-term administrators on the Discord. I thought this would be a good time to discuss the different sleep stages and their impact on polyphasic sleeping. First of all, let's go over the stages. We have four stages of sleep as well as of course one waking stage. There are three stages of non-rapid eye movement sleep and one stage with rapid eye movement. The three stages without any rapid eye movement are categorized as NREM1, NREM2 and NREM3. NREM in this case stands for non-rapid eye movement. We'll start off with NREM1. NREM1 primarily occurs when falling asleep. People that are awoken during NREM1 often don't believe they were asleep at all, even though an EEG would show significant changes to the brain waves. Next we have NREM2. NREM2 and NREM1 are often grouped together as light sleep. NREM2 is used as a transitional stage between the different sleep phases. It accounts for about half of the duration of sleep on a monophasic schedule. NREM2 has some functions. For example, it acts as a wakefulness sustainer and helps in some memory consolidation. However, like NREM1, it doesn't do anything crucial that the other sleep stages don't. Next is NREM3, also known as slow wave sleep or deep sleep. Instead of slow wave sleep, the abbreviation SWS is also very commonly used. SWS contributes greatly to memory consolidation of declarative memories, as well as tissue repair, muscle repair, and plays an important role for the immune function of the body. Arguably, one of the most important functions of SWS is the removal of metabolic wastes from the brain, but that's a topic for a different video. SWS is the deepest type of sleep we know, and is therefore also the hardest to wake from. The regions of the brain that are during waking most active have the highest level of delta waves during SWS sleep. People woken during this stage often experience headaches, grogginess and other such symptoms. This is also known as sleep inertia. This is caused by the cerebral cortex needing some more time to start back up and resuming its normal function after being in slow wave sleep. In general, a hallmark of NREM sleep is sleep spindles. On EEGs of NREM2, they are very easy to distinguish, and during NREM3 or SWS, they are also present, but a lot harder to see. Sleep spindles play an important role in memory consolidation. For example, working memory and motor memory, narrative memory and motory functions, and the lack of them is also presumed to be a biomarker for a higher risk of schizophrenia. This could also mean that people that are shortening their sleep too aggressively may have an increased risk of schizophrenia-like symptoms. However, I should note that we've only seen something like this one time on a nap-only schedule. Continuing with the hallmarks of NREM sleep, we have K-complexes. K-complexes are a characteristic feature of NREM2, though they do also appear during NREM3. They stick out on NREM2 because of their very large amplitude in relation to the other stuff happening on the EEG, but they are less obvious in NREM3 because the activity of the delta waves is a lot higher. K-complexes are hypothesized to aid in information processing, memory consolidation of emotional events, as well as processing of sensory and other external stimuli during sleep. Next, we have REM sleep or rapid eye movement sleep probably the most well-known sleep stage. REM sleep contributes significantly to procedural, spatial and emotional memory consolidation, which happens a lot during dreams. Most dreams happen during REM sleep. During REM, muscle function and thermoregulatory processes are somewhat inhibited to keep the body still during dreams. This can lead to excessive sweating upon exiting REM, especially under heavy covers during a polyphasic schedule which will have comparatively longer REM periods. During dreams, the eyes move back and forth rapidly, which is where REM sleep gets its name. It is often reported that REM heavy naps feel like a lot more time has passed, so that people having slept just 20 minutes have the feeling of waking up several hours later. This can lead to some mild disorientation, 
because people have the feeling of having lived a full two days in the space of one day, especially on shorter schedules with more wake time. Let's talk about the effect of polyphasic sleep on these stages a bit. As we just discussed, REM and SWS are both necessary for the body to function normally. While abstaining from them, sleep pressure starts to build up. After a while of getting less sleep than needed, the brain is forced to alter the sleep structure to get at least the stages that are most needed in there. SWS and REM are prioritized over light sleep, which can lead to sleep onset SWS or sleep onset REM. This means that right after you go to sleep, you will enter either of these stages. However, it should be noted that SWS in naps is quite rare, especially in sleep schedules that are over 5 hours in total length. The process of repartitioning is what gets naps to be this valuable on polyphasic sleep. It should be noted that restricting NREM2 doesn't build up excess sleep pressure, which is another argument to conclude that NREM2 does not support any vital functions. Our next topic is minimal schedule lengths. As we've established, you just need a certain amount of REM and SWS sleep to properly function. So in order to be fully adapted, you need to get the same amount of SWS and REM sleep as before you started doing a polyphasic schedule. Most people need about 90 to 120 minutes of REM and SWS both for a total of 240 to 360 minutes of quality sleep. On top of that, NREM2 sleep can't completely be cut out from the schedule since it's needed to transition between the sleep phases. The lowest amount we have seen in recordings still contain 15 to 20 percent of NREM2, so going lower than that probably won't work. These numbers are however still being investigated further. Based on this, we can say that most people can reduce their sleep time from 7 to 8 hours down to 4 hours 50 and if they're lucky even 3 and a half hours. However, those times do not take NREM2 into consideration yet. This data is also supported by the 2018 POLI survey, in which one person was able to reduce their sleep by 4.5 hours, with several more being able to reduce it by 4 hours. No one was able to shorten their sleep more than those amounts. When we later discuss scheduling, keep in mind there's a limit to how low you can go. Don't go for the hardest schedules first and keep a realistic expectation. Using what you've learned today, can save you months of impossible adaptation tries and subsequent recoveries. Don't aim for the impossible. Take care and we'll be seeing you in future videos. Hey, thanks for making it this far. I want to take this time to shout out our Kofi page. Donations go a long way with improving the knowledge of the community and help us continue the upkeep of polyphasic.net. We plan on funding experiments and sleep trackers for members of the community in the future and that in turn helps us make sure the scientific endeavors of polyphasic sleep are kept up. And if you like our content, we would really appreciate it if you subscribe and click the bell icon so you don't miss out on any future videos. Also, if you'd like to chat with us, you can join our Discord. This is where most polyphasic sleep related discussions take place. The links will be in the description. Thanks again, and I'll see you later.